it's okay. If I were at the Louvre, I didn't know what it was, I'd probably be like, eh, not bad, and keep going. But if someone were to point it out to me and sit me down and say, here is the intricate beauty of it, the complexity, here's why this is, this is so relevant, this, this is why so many people connect with their emotions and, and who they are. Take time and sit and dwell on it and sit with it and look at it. Then you get to appreciate it and see the beauty. That same sentiment is true with our Bible. There are parts of, of, of our Bible, and if you're reading your Bible, that's fantastic. I and mean, maybe you're reading it, and it's something you come across something that seems random, and maybe for lack of a better word, weird, unusual. And you accept it, it's the Word of God, but you can't really understand it. And you just breeze through it and move on to the next thing. But maybe sometimes we need somebody to sit take time with it, point out the complexity, the beauty of it, appreciate not only the portrait, but also the painter, the artist behind it. That's true with our Bible. And so today's passage can be seen in one of those random passages that's kind of weird, something that really doesn't happen every day. And you're probably familiar with it, you've heard of it. It's in the book of Luke. We're going to be in Luke's gospel Chapters 9, verses 28 through 36. Uh, The words will be on the screen above me, and if you don't have a Bible, it'll be up there. And if you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles in the seats in front of you. Please take it. That's that's our gift for you, to you for being here. Thank you for joining us. We think everyone should have the Word of God, and nobody does, the Bible doesn't do anybody any good sitting on a shelf. So that'd be our gift for you. But we have the words on the screen. Verse 28, Luke writes, Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, one for you, one for Moses, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Let's go to pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for the inspired word through your Holy Spirit that you wrote through Luke that we get to read and hear. And God, your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. So Lord, we ask for you to cut us where we need to be cut today. Teach us as only you can through the power of your Holy Spirit, not anything I can say, but only through you. Let us leave here different from when we walked in. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As Luke writes, this scene is about eight days after a few things happen. This, this is, you know, he's given the progression of what's going on. This is eight days after Jesus fed the multitudes. Probably know that story. The miracle of feeding thousands with a couple of fish and a few, bro- few loaves of bread. Where Peter's what we call the profession of, of Jesus as the Christ. Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say I am? And they say, oh, you're Moses or you're Elijah, you're a prophet. And he asks Peter, who do you say I am? He goes, you are the Christ, the Messiah. That's a big deal. Also, Jesus predicting his death and resurrection. And then telling his disciples afterwards that if you want to gain your life, you got to lose it. That the cost of following him is big. That's the next thing that happens is this account, what we call the transfiguration. That's that big word. It's used a lot. 
And the other Gospels, Matthew and Mark, uh, what we call the Synoptic Gospels, there's, there's four Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew, Luke, and Mark, they're called the Synoptic because they're very similar. They're kind of seen together. And what in their account, though, they use a different word in the original language. And the original word is called metamorpho, which is where we get the word metamorphosis. It's not a different creature, but changing from one state to the other. That's what the transfiguration is. We see Jesus changing from one state to another. So when we look at the transfiguration, we look at the entire passage, what's something we see evident throughout? Where all these things point to one truth, the central theme in these nine verses. I see it's the glory of Jesus. The glory of Jesus. I became a Christian... 16 years ago, something like that. I forget now, I should know the date, right? Not 17 years ago, sorry about that. And I didn't realize that when I came to faith in Christ, I needed to learn a brand new dialect of English. Are you familiar with that? There's a whole other language that Christians, we speak. You know, uh, we're going to fellowship. I need a hedge of protection. I'm in a season right now. All these things, all these words, it's like, if you're new to it, we're like, what does this mean? Glory to God is one of those, I believe. Where we say it, we repeat it, maybe we don't fully understand it. I'm not afraid to ask stupid questions. So I like to ask, what is the glory of God? This past week, I sat with a couple of people who were very accomplished in their faith, very knowledgeable, and I asked them, how would you define the glory of God? Uh, they looked at each other like... I think that's true. It's so many times we, we use these words and maybe we don't really know exactly how to articulate what they mean. In the original language, in this here, the, Luke writes with the word doxa. It's a Greek word. And it means one evokes of good opinion, of weight, value of it. It's actually the root word for what we call a doxology. If you're familiar with a, a church service, especially like a, a liturgy will be a, what we call is a, a doxology is a time of praise. You're praising God for his goodness. And I think the, the simplest and best definition I can give for the glory of God is the beauty of his spirit. The glory of God is his beauty of who he is. God is spirit. So all his characteristics, his attributes, what defines him, what makes him who he is, that's his glory. There was a photographer who would kind of do a social experiment. He'd go up to people and say, can I take your picture? People are pretty trusting. He said, sure. This, this young lady's one of them. So he took their picture, and then he did something different. After that, he told them, you're beautiful. And that happened. We see her beauty. Her beauty was always there. But it was revealed when she smiled. It was made evident for people to see. That's the glory of God. His beauty is always there. But when he smiles down on us, personally, when he reveals himself to you in a specific personal way, when he makes his presence felt, that is his glory. And you're just captivated by his beauty. Moses had a special relationship with God. He was the one he chose to, to lead Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. He did a lot of great things. He gave him the law. And he had such a good, close relationship that he was captivated by God. And he was able to tell him, request of him, show me your glory. He wasn't saying, show me your brightness. Show me your beauty. Let me feel your presence. That's an amazing request of God, to show me your glory. Now, Jesus is God. He's the second person of the Trinity. So when we talk about the glory of God, we're talking about the glory of Jesus. So what do we see? Here, How do we see the glory of Jesus revealed in these nine verses? First of all, the, the glory of Jesus is rooted in his humility. 
Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of others before you or a proper understanding of who you truly are. And Jesus was humble. I've, I've read a lot of skeptics. I've met skeptics before. And one common refrain for people who don't believe in what we call the divinity of Jesus, that he was God, is Jesus never said, I am God. And you know what? Those three words in that order, you're right. He never said he is God. Now, he said some other statements throughout his time, which gave the connection that, yes, he is God. But actually say, he, he never said those things. But you know what? There are some other people who have claimed to be God and didn't really work out great for them. There's Roman emperors who believe that they were gods. There are Japanese emperors and Chinese emperors all believing, and they say, I am God. David Koresh thought he was God. Sun Young Moon thought he was God. Jim Jones thought he was God. Jesus never said he was. He let the Father speak for him. He said, this is my son, my chosen one. He let God speak for him. He let, uh, he let God praise him. That just shows the humility of Jesus, how it's part of the glory of God, about the characteristics of God. We can't separate attributes of God. They all bleed into one another. His humility is an amazing part of the person of Jesus. And it's actually the humility of Jesus that Paul is writing about in Philippians 2, where he writes, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's his humility, selflessness. We all see his humility is, is evidenced by his prioritization of prayer. Jesus prayed. We see that all throughout the New Testament, especially the Gospels, we see Jesus praying. And this time, he takes John and James, two brothers, and Peter with him. Many times, we see Jesus goes off by himself and prays, but this time, he takes people with him. It was important to him. But it was also important to him that people saw him pray. This is an element of what we call discipleship. Transfer what we do to other people. Who in your life are you trying to pass down your faith to? Who are you trying to demonstrate what it means to be a Christ follower? Who are you trying to build up in their faith? Have they ever seen you pray? Have you ever prayed with them? Have they ever seen you just be moved emotionally while in communion with God on your knees? I'm part of a small group. We, we meet in each other's homes and we share a Bible study. We, we pray. We share prayer requests and we take time praying to God. A lot of us have kids uh, ranging from ages of nine up to 18. And it's, praise God, they get along. <laughs> and we used to kind of usher them off into some other part of the house so we can have our, our study. And um, one thing we, I love to hear is we'll be praying and I hear kids come up the steps, boom, 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 and then they stop because they see us praying. I hope that's something they always remember, that we are a praying group, we're a praying family, that we need God. We want to pass it on by prioritizing our prayer. So we see the glory of Jesus seen in humility and his prayer and we are given a glimpse, just a sneak peek of his majesty. It says, the appearance of Jesus' face was altered, and his clothes were, and I like this word, dazzling white. Honestly, when, before I studied this passage, I probably didn't think or realize that the word dazzling was in my Bible, but it's there. What does it mean? It means burst forth of lightning. He, his, his clothes were, were radiating the glory and the brightness. It was like lightning coming out of him. If kids today were describing it, they say Jesus got drip, right? It's just going out so hard and heavy and bright there. Just see the glimpse of Jesus, of his beauty. 
The Apostle John, in the book of Revelation, he gets a glimpse, another glimpse later on, when he sees heaven. It was in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, talking about Jesus, clothed with a long rope and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Radiating, dazzling, brightness, glory of God. You ever try looking at the sun? Maybe once, right? You tell your kids they go blind. That's what's staring at the glory of God, Jesus in his unfettered state. Glory, shining, majesty. And don't overlook the fact that it was while he was praying that his glory was revealed. When we pray, man, that's a great time for God to reveal his glory to us in a way that's something different where you're face down, just on your knees, desperate for him, and he reveals himself just a little bit. That's an amazing part about prayer, communion with God, where we get to spend time with him and reveals himself and he glorifies himself. Later on at the end of the passage, in verse 34, it says, a cloud came down and overshadowed them. People may call that the Shekinah glory of God, the presence of God, which takes us back to in the time of the Exodus when, when God took the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, out from Egypt into the promised land. And during that time, in the 40 years, because they kept messing up, took, it should have taken a week, it took them 40 years, his presence went before them, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to show his presence. And that's what those three guys got to experience. And then they see Moses and Elijah. <laughs> huh? That's kind of random. These two guys come out of nowhere, and they're having a nice chat with Jesus. Time to catch up, I guess. It's been a while. Why? Like, why these guys? Three, all of the hall of faith that we see. Why Moses and Elijah? A lot of people smarter than me have many different opinions, but I think there's two that overlap a lot of them. First, to help I correct a wrong assumption of who Jesus is. Remember earlier I said, people said, when he asked, who do people think I am? They say, well, you're a prophet, maybe Moses or Elijah coming back. He's like, no. They pointed to me, but I'm not them. And secondly, there's, there's types, you know, there's, there's types of Jesus or types of ways to help prepare the way for Jesus. The people identify elements of who he is and what he does so we see him more. See, something amazing about Moses and Elijah is neither of them we know where their bodies are. Moses, when he died, was buried by God. Nobody knows where he is. Elijah, when he died, he was taken up into heaven. And we know that we don't, the body of Jesus is no longer here. After he was on the cross, he died, he was buried. On the third day, he rose. And then 40 days, 40 days later, he ascended into heaven. So all three have that similarity. So that connects them and points them to Jesus. But the biggest reason why we see Moses and Elijah is because Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He fulfilled them. They pointed to him. The Apostle Paul, when, when he was talking about the law, the, whether you think of the Ten Commandments or the 600 plus laws that Israel had, they were just a guardian for the nation until Jesus came. They were placeholders for him. And so God knew the heart of the Israelites and that they identify with Moses more than God because God, God gave the law to Moses. And sometimes we need to remember the priority of things. In Exodus 34, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in his hand, which is the law, the first of the Ten Commandments, as he came down from the mountain, 
Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. His face just radiated because he had been with God. The law was just a placeholder pointing to the need for a Messiah, for Jesus to come to be the permanent and perpetual sacrifice for our sin. That's why Moses is there. And then Elijah, he represents the prophets, the people that God gave a message to to send to his people. That's what prophecy is. God's people with a message from God to God's people. And Malachi writes, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Elijah tells us time is getting short. That's true right now. We are one day closer today than we were yesterday till Jesus coming back and this existence being over. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to meet him? Today can be the day of salvation. Elijah's already come. We're just waiting for Jesus to come back. So all these things we see, we see the humility of Jesus, we see him praying, we see the radiance, he's dazzling, we see his clothing, we talking with dead prophets. They all point to the glory of Jesus. And at the same time, it contrasts him with us and shows our need for a savior. How short we fall every single time. The word sin, people may not like, but sin is really comes back to like an archery term where we miss the mark. <laughs> we'll never be able to hit that mark of perfection that God desires for his people. And we need Jesus to cover that difference for us. And we need to admit, the first part of that is admitting the weakness of man. I can't do it on my own. I need him. I need his glory in my life. I just need Jesus in my life. You may, if you've read the Bible, you realize that God, the people that Jesus chose to walk with him weren't exactly perfect. They're decent guys here and there. They definitely had their flaws. Peter is probably the most famous one. One thing about Peter is he chose to fall asleep and take naps at the wrong time. Jesus is praying in the garden. He's saying, watch over me, please. I got it, Jesus. He takes a nap. Here, Jesus takes a, hey, I'm going to go up the mountain and pray. What are these three guys doing? They're sleeping. Now, I love naps. I love me some naps. But sometimes when we're taking a nap, we miss out on things. When we are asleep physically and spiritually, we miss out. So while Peter and James and John were sleeping, Elijah and Moses came. Jesus didn't wake them up like, hey, yo, they're coming. Wake up. He kept going. And then they woke up midway, realizing what they missed out on. How many of us are asleep spiritually, missing out on God's activity in our lives? Where God is revealing himself, he's glo- showing his glory, and we're too numb to the things of God or too captivated by the world. And we try to fool ourselves. Our brains, which is part of our flesh, will lie to us. They'll lie to, They'll tell us things that aren't true. Our own brain will lie to us. And a lot of times that brain will tell us we're better than we truly are. You ever see a guy look at himself in the mirror? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I look pretty good. That's us. We fool ourselves every single time. And that pride can enter, it can take over in many different ways. A lot of times it's subtle. It could be sneaky, but sometimes it's very obvious with our pride. And we need other people who love God to help us out accountable. You're being wrong. Word. We need to take people spoke up. No 
nobody said. Do we insert our different? He reacted. His words. And said it. Is not wrong. Because first of all, God don't make trash. You should have a good yourself. Also, the assumed love we self. Here is creation. But when that love goes too far, in pride, Peter's pride, and we're gonna do awesome things. Go to Jerusalem. I need to get arrested. I need. Jesus had different. <laughs> That's pride. And with seeking our own, we want people to see us. God, the Father, to give an attention to Himself. But us? We want credit. I'm guilty of this, everyone else. Hey, you know what? That was my idea. I thought of that. It's going pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, that was me. Oh, yeah. Oh, you see that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, I did that. No big deal. And we crave attention. We want credit and we crave attention. Look at me. Now, social media rightfully gets a lot of blame for things going out in the world. It didn't create something new. It just made it easier for us to show our pride and to seek our own glory. And it's, so it's been around since the garden, since the fall of man. And social media, it can take things that can be good, good things that people do, and try to find a way to bring glory to ourselves. Something good that I've seen many times where maybe there's a janitor at a school who really doesn't have shoes. He's got these old boots. There are holes in them all the way. And the kids get together and they pull money together and they say, we're going to buy you a pair of boots. And they buy him new boots. And what do they do? Record it and show everybody to see. Look how good we are. Look at us. Or maybe celebrities who love attention and you see their social media posts of them like taking a nap or something like something spiritual. You ever think of like how that happened? You need to plan that and say, hold on, I'm gonna close my eyes. Why don't you, why don't you take a picture now? Because I want the glory. I want the attention. Or even Christians while praying will have people take their picture. Look at me. I don't know about you, if I'm in real prayer, I don't want anybody but God to see that. First of all, I look U-G-L-Y when I'm really in communion with God. I only want him to see my face. I'm going to call out my own people too. Pastors, people in ministry. One thing that really, oh man, breaks my heart to see is a post like this. Where people have their picture and are quoting themselves in their own picture. Wherever you go, there you are, Yogi Berra, Matthew File. Who's getting the attention? Me. Not even the guy who said it originally. And also, you ever buy a, a study Bible with a pastor's name on it? Who gets the glory there? Not God, not the Word. Our pride helps us, propels us to seek our own glory and not his. 
our own strength, our own plans. But you know, Jesus says something different, that he will humble those who exalt themselves and he will exalt those who humble themselves. In Proverbs, we read, let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger, not your own lips. Let God draw the attention to you, not yourself. I think something for us to remember, let God's glory, not our own, shine through us. A phrase you might hear in that Christianese I talked about is to glorify God. We all want to glorify God. Now, to glorify God means others see his beauty through me, not me. My actions, my words, if they point people to him and his beauty, then God is glorified. If whatever I say and do points people to me, I am glorified. I don't want that. Another thing we have to worry about with the weakness of man is, you know, it's our hypocrisy. We're hypocrites. <laughs> There's no, let's just be honest. Christians are just as much a hypocrites as the world. We try to be better. See, at the transfiguration, Jesus shone so brightly that it radiated through his clothes. So it really wasn't his clothes that were shining. It was his radiance, his beauty that was going through his clothes. It went from the inside and worked its way out. That's a glimpse of salvation where God will do something inside of you, change you on the inside, and it becomes evident to the world on the outside where we just radiate the glory of God. But what we try to do sometimes is we try to change from the outside in. If I start being better, doing better, maybe I will be better. If I try to do good things, maybe I'll be a good person. And that's the opposite of the gospel. The word hypocrite may seem really, really intense, but it comes back to a mask. There were actors who put on masks. This is my character. And they would try to behave like that character. And too many times as believers, what we do is we put on the mask, trying to act like a good Christian instead of trying to be like Jesus. We try to change from the outside in. Say, if I act this way, maybe I'll be better. As opposed to, no, God, in your strength, in your power, in your Holy Spirit, can only change happen from the inside and go out from me. Matthew and Mark use that word metamorpho, you know, to be a metamorphosis, to change. In the book of Romans, Paul uses that same word where he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be renewed. Be transformed by renewal of your mind. And later on, in 2 Corinthians, he also writes, and we all, with unveiled face. When Moses came down from the mountain, they had to put a veil on him because his face shined. With an unveiled face, so people can see the glory of God in us, beholding the glory of the Lord and being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Have God change you from the inside out. Allow God to transform us from the inside out, not the in, outside in. Don't try to act like a Christian. Try to be like Jesus. Only through the power of his spirit. Last thing about our weakness is our forgetfulness. We have short attention spans, to say the least. Wives, husbands, you know. What were we just talking about? I forget. What would you tell me to get from the store? I forget. Israel was told in their time to set up monuments to remind them of God's activity, how God brought them not only to there, but through there. To remember his activity. Because we all want, we all want only the mountaintop experience. The mountaintop experience is something like this. Like, ah, oh, bask in the glory of God. When Moses, he literally had a mountaintop experience. He went to the top of Mount Sinai and God gave him the law and he was face to face with God. Peter, James, and John literally had a mountaintop experience. They were up and God received, Jesus revealed his glory, shown his glory to them. 
And that's what we want. A few weeks ago, our, our small group, we went and call, watched a new Christian movie, The Forge. And we're all, we all left it. Oh, man, that was awesome. That was a great movie. I really want to be different. You know what happened the next morning? Absolutely nothing. We didn't change. It was a mountaintop experience. Nothing happened afterwards. Maybe you go to a Christian concert with Christian music, worship music. That's great. It's like a pep rally. It's a mountaintop experience. We don't follow through. You go to a conference. Yes, on fire for God. No change. Worship services. Oh, this is great. And we don't want the valley. We want only the mountaintop experience. We don't want the struggles. We don't want the loneliness. We don't want the doubt. Whether it be persecution, the world attacking us, or life just kicking our butt. We don't want the valley. We want only the mountaintop. Those three guys who experienced that, they denied Jesus with their actions later on. The glory of God was revealed to them personally. And they still didn't walk in the valley with him. If you're in that valley right now, God won't leave you there. You'll be there as long as he needs you to be there. As long as you need to be. But while you're there, that's when you remember the mountaintop. Because a lot of us are going to spend a lot more time in the valley than on top of the mountain. But he will lead you every step of the way. Remember his glory. At the end of the passage, it said that they didn't tell anybody about this. That's true, and it's not true, because later on, Peter wrote two books of the Bible. In 2 Peter, he writes, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. As he's talking about the transfiguration, how God showed his glory to him. So what can we do to help our forgetfulness? Share his goodness. Tell his stories. If you are a follower of Jesus, God has revealed his glory to you personally. And a great way to help for your forgetfulness is to tell people about it. I've been coaching in the school district for a few years, and the first year, the assistant principal, our principal is a great guy. He goes, who are you? <laughs> I'm just the guy showing up to help coach volleyball. And I'm like, oh, I'm one of the volleyball coaches. Yeah. He's like, well, where'd you come from? I go, Las Vegas. He's like, what? What are you doing here? I'm like, God. Well, how? Right there is my chance to tell about his goodness and his story in my life. Remember God's glory. Tell people about it. Share it. We need that. The world needs that. You know, Jesus is the personified glory of God. Glory of God in human form. And the amazing thing is, we did not need to go to a mountaintop to experience the glory of God. You can just go outside and see nature. You can look at your life and look at the, the timeline of your life and how God has moved and see his wisdom and see his glory. When, someone, when you see God smile, when you see people smile, you can see the glory of God. His glory is revealed in so many different ways. Every day, we just got to be looking for it. My, my younger daughter, she turned 13 a while ago. And the day she was born... Um, it was a C-section, so it was planned. We had an appointment to have a baby. It's kind of weird. You know, I have an appointment to have my teeth cleaned. That day, we had an appointment to have a baby. So it was cool. So we go to the hospital, something way early in the morning, and Elizabeth was born. It was awesome. And I had to run some errands, you know. <laughs> All right, had a baby, time to move on. Went on with my day, and I was driving. We were in Las Vegas at the time, and a country song came on the radio. Forgive me, I listen to country music sometimes. But it was a George Strait song. I saw God today. 
And I was at a red light, <laughs> bawling my eyes out. Because that morning when she was born, I saw the glory of God. I saw his beauty move in a way that happens every day, but we overlook it. We need to be like Moses, thirsty for it, saying, God, show me your glory. Let's pray. God, thank you for your glory. You could have chosen to be a God who's distant, removed. You don't reveal yourself to us, completely transcendent, but that's not who you are because you can't be any other way than the God that you are. Thank you for showing us your glory. Thank you for allowing us to see your beauty in the great, beautiful, huge things of creation, in the, in the telescope, but also the microscope. Reveal your glory. Show us to, to us new ways every single day as we fall in love with you more and more. We see your activity. We want to tell other people about it because we want them to experience what we have. Let us not be a forgetful people. Let us not be a prideful people. Lord, let us not, let's be a genuine people who love you and point people to you. God, thank you for revealing yourself to us. And you can do it anywhere and anyone. And I pray that everyone here has seen your glory and they are changed from the inside out. If not, Lord, today could be a day that they come to know you for the first time. Show them your glory. Let that be our prayer as we move out from here. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Today, uh, the first Sunday of every month, we celebrate communion. I may call it different things, Lord's Supper, communion. Uh, at Cornerstone, you know a few things. We practice what's called open communion. Uh, you don't need to be a member here or a regular attendee or taking any kind of class. All we ask is if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've taken that time to, to go from admit your own weaknesses, your shortcomings, and your sin, and realize you need him, and you ask him to come into your life, if that describes you, we're going we're to welcome you to be part, share this with us. Uh, but we want to do a couple things. First is we're going to take a few moments just in some contemplation. Just as we talked about the Mona Lisa earlier. Let's, how does this, how do, what does God want us to do with this, with this message today? What does he want me different? We're going to take some time, think on that, pray with that. And then we're going to celebrate together as a family, church family. So the way that works is we go down the center aisle um, and just take the elements. It's bread and juice. And go back around and have a seat. And, you're, and we're going to take some time. We're going to take the communion together. So right now, we just take some time. I'm going to pray. And then why don't we just spend some time with God. Lord, as we take this time, transition our service to a time of communion, Lord, we give you thanks give you thanks for these elements as we're about to partake. But let us not go through it casually. Point my attention, our attention to things in our lives that need to be changed from the inside out. Only you can do that. So Lord, we give you free reign. We give you a blank canvas. We dedicate this time and our attention to you. We thank you, Lord. It's your name, I pray.
in the first written account of what we call the, the Lord's Supper, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your glory, how it's been revealed in so many different ways and you're revealing it today, maybe even as we speak right now. You're revealing yourself to people in new ways. And Lord, we thank you for that. We give thank you for so much. And as Paul wrote, we, we, we thank you for your death, for, for the body that was broken to serve as the sacrifice for our sin on that cross that was nailed to that cross for our sin. And it was our sin that kept it there. And we thank you for the blood that cleanses us from every sin we've ever had, past, present, future. And we celebrate that because, Lord, we celebrate you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty tomb. We thank you for your glory. Show us your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We invite you to stand as we close our service with a song.
so much for worshiping with us today. I hope you have a great week.